My world is a sad world Often wondered if there's blame Such a fool and a mad, mad world With no picture in my frame Everyone says crazy fool You're always gazing at the night With my arms around the tree Loving life with all my mind Crazy as I may seem Not knowing what to do Living with one crazy dream In a frantic world of blue I awake every evening And somehow stumble through such a fool in a mad world Loving life with all my mind My world is a sad world Often wondered if there's blame Such a fool in a mad, mad world With no pictures in my frame Loving you without a name All right, everybody, welcome to the first real edition of Don't Drink the Kool-Aid. We were just uh, giving you a little taste of uh, recording artist Charles Manson, who is the focus of today's episode. In case anybody was asking who, uh, who that musical recording artist was, that was, in fact, Charles Manson, the uh, cult leader and mass murderer. So <laughs> today we are going to be talking about... The Manson Family Death Cult. <laughs> and that is the focus of Don't Drink the Kool-Aid. We are talking about cults, and uh, I have a fascination with true crime, and uh, pretty specifically death cults. So we'll probably get into things like, uh, we'll get into some good ones like uh, like Heaven's Gate and the Branch Davidians at some point. But for today's very special first episode of the show during the Mayhem Marathon stream, we're going to talk about the Manson Family death cult. Joining me, demented. Yeah, joining me for today's episode is Big Bob as my uh, co-host here, and uh, the tech master is the mummy. No other name, just the mummy. Mm. He's uh, going to be operating the tech for us. So, uh, before we start, Bob, tech idiot. you know a little bit about the Manson family death cult, right? A little bit about Charles Manson. Enough, a, a cursory. I know a general amount. A general amount of Charles Manson. So the way that I wanted to format the show is we're going to start off with an introduction and background. So we're going to give you some real history about Charles Manson. I want this show to be informative. So this is going to be, we're going to have fun with it, but I also don't want to have too much fun with the subject material because we are dealing with uh, people that did really demented things. And there were people that, innocent people that lost their lives. So I don't want to be, I don't want to be too... Um, I don't want to be too rude and disrespectful. Yeah, I don't want to be disrespectful to the memory of these people. So this is going to be informative, but we're obviously not very mature, so we're probably going to make <laughs> stupid jokes too. Um, I'm quite mature. Yeah, right. You're you, the least mature. Uh, well, no, you're pretty mature sometimes. No, he, like, no, he's not. You told me to be serious, so I'm being serious. I will point out that Bob is being. <laughs> he's not being serious. He's just not saying anything. Bob is being. It's only because he can't not. Only way he can be is loud and joking. Bob is being on his best behavior right now, so I'm very. By not paying on any behavior. Yeah. Uh, so let's start. Don't start. How, what is the chat saying? Is the chat excited about? Nah, uh, the chat. Generally, the chat's stupid. So. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, don't say that. Don't say that about the chat. So this. Oh, sorry, chat. I'm in the chat. Just saying it. Yeah, Nathan, 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 give us a heads up if the chat works. Evie said she falls asleep every night to true crime podcasts. Oh, perfect. So you'll be super into this then. So if anybody wants to if anybody chimes in and has any questions, just let me know, Nathan. Someone, uh, someone's talking about Dennis Wilson. I think a lot of people know the, a lot okay. of this information good, good, that good. they're about to hear tonight. So we're gonna start with a little introduction about and this is gonna be in a podcast version at some point in the future, so uh, we're gonna be reading off a little bit of a script here. So if I'm looking down 
please don't th throttle me in the chat because I'm reading off the script that I've created here. <laughs> you do uh, not want to throttle Tom. Yeah. I'll so, throttle him later. Yeah, Bob will throttle me later. So, <laughs> yeah. as far as an introduction and background, so Charles funny. Mills Manson was born November 12th, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Very far away. See, there's already a problem. Okay? There's already, there's there's already a problem. Yeah. And uh, we could obviously get way deeper into this, but this is going to be like a 30-minute show. So we're not going to get... This is 30 minutes? This is going to be like 30 minutes talking about it. So, so we're not going to get super hardcore in-depth. If you would like me to get more in-depth, we can do another episode later on. But do you have a question? Yeah. What is your question? I gotta behave for thirty minutes. You gotta behave for thirty. Well, you can make some, you can make some jokes, but let me get through the bulk of the information. Oh, holy! Let me get through the let me get through the bulk of the information, then you can joke around. Okay. All right. So he was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, to uh, Kathleen Maddox and Colonel Walker and Henderson Scott Senior, who, although this is his biological father, he was absent for most of uh, <coughs> most of Manson's life. He left shortly after finding out that Kathleen Kathleen was a teenage girl. Uh, he left shortly after. She announced that she was pregnant. Uh, Henderson Scott Sr., although his, name, his actual legal <coughs> name was Colonel, so he said that he was in the Army and he was going to actually go into the Army. He wasn't in the Army, but he was absent for most of Charles's young life. Charles's mother was a criminal, and unfortunately for Charles, set the example starting from birth to the young Manson. And although Charles spent a brief period of time living in a relatively stable home with relatives, while his mother was incarcerated, this was not to last, as his mother was paroled and he went to go live with her in Indianapolis. For all of his mother's faults, uh, I believe the quote that I read from Manson, it was like in an interview or whatever, he said that he loved his mother because she didn't, he, she made him learn everything and do everything for himself. Yeah. But he definitely learned how to become a criminal from his mother. Uh, Char like good parenting. I mean, she was not. It was not a good upbringing in the beginning. Charles would eventually end up spending considerable amount of time in reform schools. Eventually, ending up in prison for a bulk of his formative years. He was beaten. He was raped. He was beat. He beat other people. He did his defense. He called this thing called. Uh, it was called like the crazy game or something. Like when he felt threatened, his whole defense strategy was to just act wild and like yell and scream and like flail. And he just out crazied people. And that's how he got people to leave him alone. I, uh, I do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but one thing that Charles did learn, and eventually he did end up wanting to become a, he started to learn that he needed to become like a model prisoner. And he eventually did want to do well. So although he was borderline illiterate, he did eventually learn enough to like learn how to read, and he did have some propensity for being like pretty decent at music. Mm -hmm. So he started playing guitar, and a lot of people encouraged him to play guitar, and he had some enthusiasm towards becoming a musician. Is that the song we heard? That was eventually a demo that he, he did release. He released a lot of stuff, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah, that was a pretty good song. That's the thing about Charles Manson that a lot of people don't know, is that he when he did come to LA, he was on the outskirts, the fringe of the LA music scene. He had a real shot of becoming a serious recording artist. Which would have been way worse, probably. But no, I think that that would have probably, like, he would have just become, like, a. that's all he wanted. He wanted yeah, but to he would have done way, he would have, like, Cosby people because he would have just got away with it, probably. I think that Charles Manson, all he wanted was, he wanted some fame, he wanted money, and he wanted girls to like him. And I think if... If they had given him a couple albums yeah. and he had made a little bit of money, I think he would have been a crappy person. He wouldn't have been a good dude, but I don't think that he would have murdered or he would he not he wouldn't have ordered people to murder a bunch of people because of his sick revenge fantasy. Uh, but Charles eventually learned how to uh, shred in prison, and who says prison can't reform? Shred the guitar in prison. Played the the Daily's. Was uh, that a joke? That was a joke. That was, was, was a Tom joke. No. I'm not allowed to joke, so I didn't make it. You can joke. joke. I just don't want you no, to be I'm either serious or a joke. Well, Charles, although he was trying to be good, eventually he did wind up in prison for everything from stealing cars to violent crime, petty theft, and forging checks. So eventually he ended up spending real time in prison. But while he was in prison... He ended up meeting somebody who was, he worked for Universal Records, who heard Charles playing guitar and thought that Charles actually was decent. Yeah. And he heard his songs and he was like, okay, well, when I get out, 
And I forget the guy's name. I didn't list it here. But he was like, okay, when I get out, uh, I need you to go, go to L.A. And I'm going to get you a real shot with, a, with an executive. Mm-hmm. And so ch- that gun into Charles' mind was like, okay, I need to get to L.A. And I need to have a meeting with this guy. And that's going to be my ticket to stardom. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's what happened. In 1967, Charles Manson, after getting released from prison... Winded up in sunny Los Angeles to pursue a career in music. What did he go to prison for the first time? Uh, everything from stealing cars to forging checks to violent crime. So he just was, general bad guy stuff? He was... But not, not really that bad? He wasn't that bad. He was a petty criminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Petty thief. Yeah. He was a petty thief that, like, he made his money off doing just general petty criminal garbage. He didn't really, like, do anything too serious at that time. He was just generally, like, he wasn't deranged yet. He was just a petty criminal. Uh, but uh, eventually he arrived, he arrived in L.A. in the late 60s. This was during the hippie movement. Uh, Charles ended up getting, he listened to the Beatles. He idolized the Beatles. While he was in prison, too, something that he would kind of, like, check into his mind for later, uh, he got into a few things. He got into things like Scientology, and he kind of, like, picked and choose things that he wanted to take from these religions and stuff. Uh, so he learned some stuff from Scientology that he would later use in his cult. He learned some things. He took a course on the book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he learned that. And he kind of, like, put all this stuff in the back of his mind to be like, okay, that's what I'm going to use to, like, help me lure these followers in. But he didn't believe in any of it, like, really. He was just like, okay, this is going to be something. He didn't? He was just stuff he could use later. I mean... Also, he uh... was into like his family was like Christian so he had some Christian stuff that he like indoctrinated in he had all this stuff but when he got out of prison it was the hippie movement so he got out and he was like okay well now there's hippies but then he realized that he could like be the hippie master and lure all these young girls in to do his bidding and that's eventually what happened um funny it's kind of a funny story but when Charles Manson arrived in LA to pursue his career in music Charles was actually talented enough to have songs written for or covered by bands like the Beach Boys and Guns N' Roses. Really? Yeah. Uh, A lot of people don't know this, but Charles Manson, and I'll get into this when we talk about his music career, he actually wrote a song for the Beach Boys. They didn't credit him on it. Someone already said something in the chat about that. Yeah, they they took one of his songs. We're getting there, bud. We're getting there, okay? So... The first story, his first major, like, almost break. And that's the thing. Charles Manson was so close to breaking in. So he ended up meeting with his record executive, the record executive that his buddy in prison told him that he had to meet with. And when Charles Manson came in, picture this, like, hippie guy with long flowing hair. And he called himself the gardener because he uh, dug all the flower children. Yeah. So he showed up with a whole gaggle of beautiful young girls, barefoot, with his guitar and flowing hair, and this guy, this record executive was like, I don't know if I like this guy, but there's something to him. And he liked Charles Manson's, like, the cut of his vibe. He felt like he was the real deal. So he was like, okay, I'm going to give you a shot. Let's, let's record a demo. But when Charles Manson got into the studio, he, this was the first time that he had an engineer saying, like, you got to do it again. Do this take again. We need to redo this Oh, he had guitar. someone telling him what kind of what to do. And he freaked out. He couldn't deal with it. Yeah. So he had a real shot. Because he's such a Captain Controllo. He was a Captain Controllo. And, like, he had a studio guy being like, okay, like, redo it, redo it. And it wasn't even, like, someone telling him what to do. It was just, he's just like, like, you need to redo this. He just didn't track. understand how the music industry it, worked. Yeah, like, how recording, like, to make it actually sound awesome. An executive from Universal Records was like, I'm going to give you studio time. Yeah. And you're going to be able to record a demo. I just need you to listen to what I'm saying. And he blew it. But the guy was still interested enough that he still followed Charles around a little bit for a little while because he was going to cast him in a movie as Jesus or like some, it was something like that. Or he was going to like base the part on him. And Charles, to his credit, was kind of the real deal. So this guy followed Charles to the beach and Charles was there preaching all of his like cult stuff on the beach. And this guy on the beach overheard what Charles was talking about. And at this time, they had a big like bus that they were all living in and partying in or whatever. And the guy was like, like Jeffin? Like Chaffin, he had a big school bus. Uh, and the guy was like, well, if you really believe in all this stuff, you don't need that bus then. And Charles was like, you're right, man, I don't need it. Threw the keys to the guy, and the guy drove away with the bus. 
Charles was like kind of the real deal of that. Even though he was doing it as an act, yeah. he was still kind of like walking the part of being this like hippie guru guy. Yeah. But eventually Charles ended up uh, so he went through this guy, he went through some other recording industry people. He was on the fringe of the LA music scene. Eventually he ended up impressing Beach Boys drummer Dennis Wilson. Uh, who collaborated with Manson and his ever-growing family compound, allowing several members to live at his mansion until eventually getting uh, kicked out. Uh, the funny story is, is that eventually Dennis Wilson kind of got like sick of all of Charles Manson's like antics, because Charles was like eating all of his food, partying in his house, trashing everything. He had all these girls living there, and like Dennis Wilson was not a great dude. Like he was sleeping with all of these like girls and stuff that Charles Manson was just like, here, have more. Um, but after the other beach boys ran a background check on Charles Manson, they realized that he was a criminal and stuff. And they were like, Dennis, we don't want you associating with Charles Manson anymore. But Dennis still kind of liked him. And well, one, he was, that's, that's what his whole thing was. He was super likable. Wasn't he? he was very likable and personable. And Dennis, Dennis Wilson before this had like, live. Yeah, Dennis Wilson was on a lot of drugs and, like, all this other thing. So, like, he believed in a lot of what Charles Manson was kind of talking about. And he was very susceptible to all this stuff. But eventually, Dennis Wilson didn't want to kick him out. So Dennis Wilson moved to another house without telling Charles Manson. And then when the landlord evicted the people, like, Dennis Wilson, he was evicting Charles Manson. So that was effectively Dennis Wilson being like, this is how I can get rid of you, but I don't have to do it so I can still kind of be friends with you because I still kind of like what you're all about and I still kind of want to write music with you, but like not really. So that's where, and I'm sure the chat will be commenting on this, that's where that song, and eventually Charles Manson wrote this song for Dennis Wilson called Cease to Exist that the Beach Boys, or not the Beach Boys, but Dennis Wilson changed the name of the song and he passed it off as Dennis Wilson wrote this song uh, not Charles Manson. Uh, and so Charles Manson didn't get any credit on the song. But he did. Really? There is a recorded Beach Boy song that Charles Manson actually wrote. And he wrote it, like, to try to get, like, in there. Like, Dennis Wilson was like... Is it a Beach Boy style song? Or is it like a... No, it's kind of like Moody Blues. It's like a weird 70s song. I don't know. Or like late 60s. It's like... Not into it. Well, this is at the time that the Beach Boys were, like, not popular anymore. This is when they all started doing drugs and they were all kind of like... They started all getting in, and the Beatles too. They all started kind of getting into like the weirdness. Yeah, just, oh yeah, yeah. So the Beach Boys were really, sitar music. Yeah, and they were all into that stuff at that time. Uh, but eventually, they were kicked out, and Charles Manson and his family ended up at the now infamous Spawn Ranch, which was this old movie ranch. Um, and that's where Charles Manson and all of his followers eventually ended up. And Dennis Wilson would go there and like. And where was that? It was in California, but it was kind of like above LA. And basically, Is Dennis Wilson the cop. Dennis Wilson was a Beach Boy. Oh. And he was kind Pay of attention, dude. Trying, there's a yeah. lot of information. Dennis, like, like a half hour and that was kind of like Charles Manson trying to like get in with the music industry. And Dennis Wilson was kind of like his last real shot to like do it, and he kind of like blew it with Dennis Wilson, and then it was kind of like. I mean, there is, there are, we did listen to some of it. There are recorded demos that were kind of recorded around this time. Dennis Wilson really believed in Charles Manson, but unfortunately the, and Dennis Wilson, to his credit, he did like pitch this demo to his record studio being like, hey, I like this guy, Charles Manson. Here's his demo. I think we should put it out. But the other Beach Boys didn't want anything to do with Charles Manson. The studio didn't want anything to do with Charles Manson. And it kind of like, blew it. This was like his last shot to do it. So they ended up in the Spawn Ranch. Dennis Wilson's a, a hunk. 70s he was, hunk. 60s he was, hunk. Dennis Wilson was a great, he was a good looking guy. He was a, he was a cool dude. Dennis Wilson tragically ended up dying later. Uh, and a lot of people say that it's because of what Charles Manson did later on. And like Dennis Wilson kind of like spurned on a lot of this stuff by like encouraging Charles Manson. And then when Charles... So Manson, he was just as crazy. Dennis Wilson was on a lot of drugs and stuff. And then, like, after after what happened to Charles Manson and, like, his followers and stuff, yeah. Dennis Wilson, like, disassociated himself with the Beach Boys. They kicked him out of the Beach Boys. Yeah. Like, they, they were like, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Dennis Wilson's drug use escalated. He ended up losing all of his money, and he ended up drowning in a tragic incident. And Dennis Wilson... Suey? 
he was drunk, like maybe nobody really knows. Like, yeah, he just yeah. Right. The funny thing about Dennis Wilson too is that he was kind of the only real Beach Boy. He was the only Beach Boy that had the long hair. He had the good like surfer boy looks. He he was the only Beach Boy that actually surfed. Yeah. He was the only real Beach Boy. Well, I mean, you could be on the beach and not surf. But, like, the Beach Boys all sang about, like, surfing USA, surf safari. Yeah. And he was the one that, like, like, beca- like he was the one that did all that stuff. But kind of a tragic story. If you ever want to listen to a really... This is an album shout-out. If you want to listen to a really good album, Dennis Wilson has a piano album that he did after, in the 70s, called P- uh, Pacific Ocean Blue. It's really sad, but it's really... It's a really, like... Is it, is it heroin-y? He was he on was he on the he was on a ton was of he on the needle he was really strung out at that time uh, and he was an alcoholic and all this stuff <laughs> but if you want to listen Stress. if you want to listen to a really like sad like cool album yeah. it's just called Pacific Ocean Blue it's a really cool album and when people asked him to do another one because people really liked it uh, he said no it's too painful I can't do another one well I mean but you're anyway emo, you're emo, you know? yeah but anyway uh, Charles Manson ended up on the ranch. This is when things started to really escalate. This is when the orgy started to happen. This is when Charles Manson started really preaching about apocalyptic stuff, dosing his followers with LSD daily, and really, awesome. well, he really started preaching uh, Helter Skelter, which eventually ended up leading to what happened in the end, which was awful and horrible. But So Charles Manson believed that he was receiving messages in the Beatles' White Album, I think, in the song... In a bunch of their songs, but the song Helter Skelter, he thought was being directed towards him and his followers, and he thought that he was being commanded by the Beatles to commit a series of awful murders to make it look like African Americans were murdering white people to cause a race war in America. And that's what he thought that Helter Skelter was. And what is Helter Skelter about? It was not as a seventies Beatles song. It had nothing they they weren't putting messages to Charles Manson. It was Charles Manson. Like, Do you know that? I don't. I, I guess I don't know that, but I'm pretty sure that the Beatles weren't putting messages to Charles Manson to start a giant race war in America. I'm pretty sure that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a thing. Uh, but Manson believed that these messages... <laughs> LDS. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It wasn't good. But eventually mm. that led up to what was the awful, awful things that Charles Manson is remembered for, which is the Sharon Tate La Bianca murders. Uh, which were a series... Sharon Tate is beautiful. Sharon Tate is beautiful, and if you've never seen the movie Fearless Vampire Killers, which is a movie starring her husband, Roman Polanski, that he also directed, but she's in it too. It is a really underrated horror comedy from, like, the 60s, I guess. Like I mean, it was around that time. But she was married to... Uh, I see Sharon Tate. Sharon Tate was beautiful. She was a very, she was a very, uh, she was a very beautiful woman for the time. But these were a series of murders conducted by members of the Manson family, led by Manson family member Tex Watson, among other members, uh, on August Whoa. 8th and 9th, 1969, which claimed the lives of at least seven people and probably a ranch hand who knew a little bit too much on the Spawn Ranch who was discovered several years later. Uh, so four members of the family infiltrated the home of Sharon Tate and director Roman Polanski at 10050 Celio Drive in Los Angeles. The house is not there anymore. Uh, What's that guy's name again? Tex, what was his name? Tex Watson was the kind of like, he was like the muscle. That's a cool name. Yeah, he, and I, I guess he was infamous for on the Spawn Ranch, he would walk around with a six shooter spinning it and yeah. like shooting it. He thought he, he was, you know, his name, he lived up to his name, Tex Watson. Okay, that's cool. Uh, so the members of the Manson family, they murdered Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant at the time, along with three friends who were uh, visiting at the time, and an 18-year-old visitor who was visiting the caretaker, who was slain as he was departing the home in his car. Polanski was not present on the night of murders as he was working on a film in Europe. Uh, the murders were carried out by Tex Watson under the direction of Charles Manson. Watson drove Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabi, and Patricia Krenwinkel from the Spawn Ranch to Those Celia girls Drive. all have dark hair? Those are all the girls with the dark hair. That is them. And yeah. this is Tex. Yeah. Tex looks like, what's his name from Sliders? He, oh, uh, what's his name? Uh, o- Dun- uh, O'Connell. Oh, Jerry O'Connell. Jerry O'Connell is what Tex Watson <laughs> Jerry looks Jerry O'Connell like. committed these horrible, horrible murders on the, 
Jerry O'Connell from Sliders and uh, and three Gothic girls and three Gothic girls. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So on the night of August eighth, nineteen sixty nine, Tex Watson took Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Cranwinkle to that house that Melcher, who was a record executive, used to live, and uh, Manson told them to totally destroy everyone in it. Oh my God! Uh, as gruesomely as you can. Uh, Manson had told the had told the women to do uh, as Watkins would instruct them. It Cren- looks like the house. Yeah, uh, you know the Will Rogers State Park. It's yeah. It's like a it's like that older style house. You know the Will Rogers State Park is a park out here in L.A. and it's like who, it's Will Rogers' house, right? Um, yeah. It looks just like this that same house. Yeah, it's very in all these pictures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it has that old sixties L.A. look barn yeah. barn house. Will Robinson. Will Robinson, that's something about. I always say it backwards. Wait, no, Rob, what is it? <laughs> so I always get that. Will Rogers State Will, Park. Will Rogers State Park. Will Rogers, that's like uh, his house. But yeah, so Polanski was renting the house with his wife, who's eight and a half months pregnant, as I said. Shit. So oh, he just spilled my water all over the place. Did you just dump the water out on the counter? Okay, so Bob just emptied my entire uh, glass. Did you get a towel? Bob, get oh a my towel. Oh, God. Bob just took the class. We may have need emergency services Bob just, in the studio. Bob just took the glass and just dumped it. For no reason. <laughs> Why did you do that? I asked Bob to not do anything, and he took a, an entire glass of water and just dumped it all over the place for no reason. That's what you get with Bob. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why you did that, but, but I my bot. There, there was half a glass of water in there. I know that, yeah, not anymore. Okay. Technical difficulty we'll in the studio. We'll have to edit that. This just shows that we are really dumb, even when we're trying to do something serious here. Bob's really dumb. I can't. Um, so at the time, uh, Sharon Tate was there, along with her friend and former lover, Jay Sebring, a noted hairstylist. Polanski's friend and aspiring uh, screenwriter, uh, I can't pronounce his name, I think it's Wojciech Frykowski. And Frykowski's lover, Abigail Folger, who was actually the heiress to the Folger Coffee fortune uh, and daughter of Peter Folger. Polanski was in Europe working on a film project. Uh, Tate had accompanied him, but returned uh, home three weeks earlier. Uh, interesting note, music producer Quincy Jones was supposed to be there that evening, uh, but was not, uh, as he had originally intended to go. Uh <laughs> Yeah. Talking to yourself. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm talking to the audience. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, Educating the audience. And now you'll have to join in as well. Uh, so when the murderers arrived at the entrance to Celio Drive property, Watkins, who had already been in the house on at least one other occasion, climbed a telephone pole near the entrance gate and cut the phone line to prevent telephone access to the house. At that point, it was around. It was after midnight, August 9th, 1969. The group backed their car to the bottom of the hill. They parked it there. They hid there. Then they made their way up the hill to the grounds. Uh, just then, headlights approached from farther within the property, um, and that's when uh, Watkins ordered the woman. Uh, Watkins ordered, ordered the women to lie in the bushes. He stepped out and ordered the approaching vehicle to halt. Eighteen-year-old student Stephen Parent had been visiting the property's caretaker William Garretson, who lived in the property's guest house, uh, and leveled a 22 caliber revolver at him. The frightened youth begged Watson not to hurt him. Claiming he wouldn't say anything, Watkins at first lunged a parent with a knife, giving him a defensive wound before shooting him to death. Uh, Watkins then ordered the women to help push the car further up the driveway. After traversing the front lawn and having Linda Kasabian search for an open window to the main house, Watkins cut a screen window. Watkins told Kasabian to keep watch by the gate. She walked over to the parent's AMC ambassador and waited. He then removed the screen, entered the house, and let Atkins and Krenwinkel in, a, in the front door. As Watkins whispered to Atkins, a sleeping Frykowski awoke on the living room couch. Watkins kicked him in the head. Uh, when, uh, when Frykowski asked him who he was and what he was doing there, Watkins says, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. On Watkins' directions, Atkins found the house, three other op- uh, occupants, and Krenwinkel's help forced them in the living room. Watkins began to tie Tate and Sebring's up by their uh, necks with a rope, and he brought them, he slung it over the ceiling beams in the house, tied them together. Sebring protest, his second of rough treatment, uh, to the pregnant Tate prompted, prompted Watkins to shoot him. Folger was then taken momentarily back to the bedroom for a purse. She was robbed. After that, Watkins began, uh, stabbed the groaning Sebring seven times, 
I think at that point, Jay Sebring was dead. This is demented. <laughs> Frankowski. I, I hate this. Well, it's almost over. I hate, this is our spooky episode, and this, I, this is too spooky for me. Frankowski's hands had been bound with a towel. Freeing himself, Frankowski began struggling with Atkins, who stabbed at her legs with the knife, uh, which she had been guarding him with. As he fought his way towards the front door and out onto the porch, Watkins caught up with Frankowski, struck him over the head with the barrel of the gun, stabbed him repeatedly, and then shot him twice. Watkins broke the gun's uh, right grip in the process. Around this time, Kasabian was drawn up from the driveway by horrifying sounds. She arrived outside the door. In a vain e- e- effort to halt the massacre, she falsely told Atkins that someone was coming. So somebody in, in, in this crew was trying to stop it, uh, which was uh, uh, Kasabian. Inside the house, Folger had escaped from Krenwinkel and fled at a bedroom door to the pool area. Folger was pursued to the front by Krenwinkel, who caught her, stabbed her, and finally tackled her to the ground. She was dispatched by Watkins. Again, Watkins dispatched somebody, and they stabbed Folger 28 times. Demented. As Frykowski struggled across the lawn, Watkins murdered him with a final flurry of stabbings. Frykowski was stabbed a total of 51 times. Demented. In the house, and this is the worst one, (laughs) in the house, Tate, Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant, uh, pleaded to be allowed to to live long enough to have her baby, even offered herself as a hostage in an attempt to save the unborn child. At this point, either Atkins, Watkins, or both killed Tate, who was stabbed 16 times. Watkins later wrote that as she was being killed, Tate cried, Mother, Mother. Oh my God. Earlier, as the four members uh, of the house were heading out to Spawn Ranch, Manson had told the women to leave a, a sign, something witchy. Using the towel that had been bound around Frykowski's hands, Atkins wrote pig on the, on the house's front door in blood. En, en route uh, home, the killers changed out of their bloody clothes, which were ditched in the hills along with their weapons. Uh, funnily, enough, funnily enough, the police didn't actually find any of this clothing. It was an ABC News reporter who retraced the killer's steps, and he outsmarted the police by founding all of this stuff before. Uh, also, it doesn't list it here in my information, but also during this rampage, they also killed the uh, La Biancas. The La Biancas were uh, members of a... Uh, a family that owned a chain of grocery stores in LA. That's where they actually wrote Helter Skelter uh, on a uh, door, I believe, inside of their house. Um, and they spelt it wrong. They spelt it Helter Skelter. Oh my God. Uh, and they wrote that in the, in the, in the uh, La Bianca's blood as well. And it was, it was awful. It was awful. But eventually, after months of investigating, um, the LAPD, they didn't have any leads for a very long time. But eventually the district attorney had what he needed and they were able to charge. And Manson and his family were suspects for a while, but eventually they were able to prove it. And uh, the district attorney, his name was, uh, his prosecutor rather, his name was Vincent Bugliosi, who also wrote the book Helter Skelter, which is a really good book, by the way, ended up, convi- he ended up, yes, that's here. He ended up convicting uh, all of these members of the Manson family, including Charles Manson of murder. Uh, they ended up, Charles Manson ended up spending, uh, he ended up spending all of his life in prison. Uh, Charles Manson... Did the uh, girls not mention him? Do they not want to rat him out? Did they not say that he, they were, he was connected? Did they just take the blame? N- no. They were... Like, it was all... Like, Charles Manson was part of this family. Like, he was... He was indicted. And this was all part I'm of... I'm saying in the very beginning. No, this was all part of his, like, grand design. Like, he... But, like, when these girls got arrested... Yeah. Did they know he was connected? Did they say, oh, yeah, Charles Manson told us to do it? I, I believe or did they arrest these girls thinking they did it and didn't know anything about Charles Manson until later? They no, they, they were all arrested together. Like they were all known as like members. Oh. They were all known as members of Charles Manson's. Like, oh, cult. so it was a public thing that they knew people who joined his cult. Charles Manson was on the suspects list for he was like top of the list for a long time. But it took them a little while to get the proof that they needed, like witness statements. Like for example, there was a member of the Manson family who wanted to testify against Manson. The Manson family didn't want her to testify, so they agreed to, like, they tried to, like, butter her up by saying, if you don't testify, we'll fly you to Hawaii for free for a vacation. And she said, okay. And then they tried to overdose her on LSD. They put it in her, like, food. When she was in Hawaii? Yeah. They tried to kill her? Tried to overdose her in Hawaii. Wow. Also, side note, I didn't know this, but um, Squeaky Frome, who is a member of the Manson cult, she ended up trying to kill Gerald Ford. The president? <laughs> Later on, yeah. Like, so Manson's reach was like 
far beyond all of this. So Manson's family, for a long period but of they time... they weren't his family. They were, these were just people that joined well, his people, cult. They people called him the Manson cult. family. Um, yeah. But eventually... So, from what I've read from all my research... And this compound is where they all lived? The Spawn Ranch was kind of like where they all lived at the end. And that's where they found the evidence. Where was this? Like, Topanga or Malibu? It was above... Yeah, it was above LA. It was like north of Los Angeles. Okay. I think, if I remember correctly, like looking at like Google Earth, it was like a 40-minute drive to get to the Hollywood Hills. And did he buy this or something? No. So, the funny story about that is that they moved onto the property, which is owned by this 80-year-old dude. And then... Uh, I believe it was Squeaky Frome, uh, who was like, a member of the Manson cult. She ended up becoming kind of like the old guy's girlfriend. And then in exchange for like entertaining the guy, they were all allowed to stay on the compound, which was actually an old like series of movie sets, like Western movie sets. Uh. And they built it up like Manson would perform his sermons inside the inside the saloon and all this like other crazy stuff. But... Eventually, Manson was convicted along with the members of his family for all of these horrible crimes. Charles Manson eventually would spend the rest of his life in prison, dying of a heart attack November 19th, 2017, at the age of 83. Wow. November 19th? Yeah. That's so like a year ago today. It was almost a year ago today that Charles Manson oh, wait, died. In, yeah, well, almost a year ago today he died in prison. This is depressing. Yeah, but that's it. That's here. this is an abridged version of the Manson family death. Cult. Well, now why are we supposed to discuss this disgustingness? Well, what you what you learn about Charles Manson? I learned that I didn't want to know any of this. Let's I didn't know. I honestly, I never knew what Charles Manson did. I just knew he was a bad guy and he had that swastika on his forehead. He did. Actually, I didn't even know that until I just found this picture. Yeah. I was like, oh, he's the guy with the swastika. He was a Nazi. No, he just apparently. No, Char- no, Charles Manson was like he was among other things. He was like a racist. But he did that in prison to like make people like yeah annoyed so or something. When, so Charles Manson, like if you look at pictures of his followers dur- during the trial, they all carved X's on their forehead. All the girls too. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that's what Charles Manson originally had. They copied him. Straight edge. No, it wasn't straight they were edge. like different. Yeah, like they're. Yeah, not positive. Yeah, eventually, like he, yeah, he ended up carving an axe, and they all carved an axe in their foreheads. I hate uh, it. I, well, I don't like talking about any of this. It was bad. It was a bad call. It was bad. Yeah, and no kidding. Charles Manson murders were. Charles bad. Charles Manson was bad. Uh, the cultural influence that I can mention here is that uh, even up to today, uh, people are still influenced by this. The plot of Quentin Tarantino's new movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, which is planned to be released in 2019, is largely inspired by the Tate LaBianca murders. So this year, you'll see Tarantino's... Ta- I think Margot uh, Robbie is playing... Girl's super attractive. She's playing Sharon Tate in the movie. And uh, I forget who's playing Charles Manson. I think it's an Australian guy. Oh, uh, there's a guy right here. There's a picture of him. Yeah, not it's not Hugh Dancy or whatever from... Hannibal. Leonardo it's, DiCaprio is in the movie, right? Leonardo DiCaprio plays a stuntman, I think, and Brad Pitt plays an actor. Um, but, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Emil Hirsch plays, um, uh, what's his name? Jay Sebring. Like, all these people are played by famous. Uh, Kurt Russell's in the movie. All his regular. All, all the regular, like, Tarantino guys are going to be in the movie. So, even up until today, we're still talking about Charles Manson. Like, it's still culturally relevant that people are still interested and I think a lot about Hitler and that's even older yeah you know I think a lot of Manson and this is really sad and we kind of talked about it before is that if Manson had got even like a one record deal I don't think that he would have murdered anybody I think that he would have got I I don't think so I think he would have got I think that if Manson had like a lot I don't know, of, because he was insane. Like, you can't stop insanity. Yeah, he could have gone on a different path, but I think eventually he would have done bad things to people. Because if it's in him, I think it was in him. I think that he would have been, like, a crappy rock star, but I don't think he would have murdered anybody. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of what Manson did, like, a lot of, like... He can say what he wanted about, like, this being, like, some cultural revolution that he was trying to create. A lot of what he was doing was just his revenge fantasy against the rich ruling class of Hollywood. Like he he, w- he wanted to be a rich ruling class. He wanted to be a, a member of the rich ruling class, and he was almost there a couple of times, and he didn't he, he didn't make it. Uh, that in conjunction with doing LSD for like ten years, 
a lot of a lot of LSD uh, probably didn't help, and he kind of went a little more bonkers than he already was. But it was, yeah. I mean, the Charles Manson story is it's interesting. Um, I don't know. It's really sad. I, Seth and I were watching, like we watched Fearless Vampire Killers, and that for the first time, I showed him that movie for the first time, and that's when I was like, oh, Sharon Tate is the one that, like, she's the one that was murdered by Charles Manson. And he didn't know about that at the time. And was I, don't like, oh. know. I don't know any of this stuff. The girl's beautiful. I, I know. Yeah. So thank you very much for joining us for the first episode of Don't Drink the Kool-Aid, a show all about cults. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of Don't Drink the Kool-Aid, a show all about cults, cult leader and cult leaders and all of their influences on society and aftermath is Aftermath. Aftermath is. Aftermath is. After Walter Matthau is of the wake of their destruction. I am Tomb, your host, and I'll see you next time.